To Muslims, the life of Muhammad is a story revered. In its mysteries as much as its certainties, there are beliefs held sacred. Whatever we can tell about the Prophet, of course, is screened through the filter of what has been preserved over the centuries and what people have wanted to preserve. And it's very difficult to pull out from all of these different sources that are very adoring and the ordinary human being, that, uh, the, the, the person that he was. We do know that Muhammad was born in or around 570 AD in the sun-blasted Arabian Peninsula, a land of savage scarcity whose Bedouin tribes were locked in a constant state of tribal war. While still an infant, Muhammad's parents gave him his first taste of life in the desert. Muhammad was from a town, Mecca, but he was sent off to live with the Bedouin because the people, even in the town of Mecca, felt that the Bedouin were the holders of the, the deeper cultural Arab values. And the Bedouin view the townspeople as having lost their really authentic roots in Arab culture and the poetry and, and uh, animal husbandry and all the things that uh, they, they do so well. By the time Muhammad was six, both of his parents had died. And he was taken under the protection of his uncle, chief of his clan. Being an outsider gave him a singular perspective. He'd been orphaned early and developed very early on a passionate sense of concern for those who are left out of society. Uh, to be orphaned in a tribal society where clan and family relationships are your keys to everything, success, status, honor, dignity, um, is, is to face what it really feels like to be marginalized. And that obviously had a, a, a very deep impression on him as a young man. In some ways, it was detrimental, of course, to grow up without parents, but in other ways, he was so adaptable. He had many parents, he had many fathers, he had many mothers, so it made him a child of everybody. Muhammad's clan, like Arabs all across the Arabian Peninsula, would share the stories that had been told and retold for generations. Pre-Islamic Arabian civilization was largely an oral culture and uh, there was tremendous respect for and admiration for people who could express themselves orally and especially those who could recite poetry almost at the drop of a hat. Some of the most important people in a tribe were the poets. As they sang of the glory of the tribe, they they, ta they told the story of the tribe. To the Bedouin, the word had a mystical importance. Poets linked the tribe to its ancestors and celebrated values older than memory. Poetry was the sinew that bound the Bedouin together, celebrating their victories, lamenting their defeats. The poems themselves, like the poems of Homer, both celebrate this great heroic ethos and yet intimate in the deepest way the tragedy that um, this war, this ethos of constant tribal warfare uh, brings to people. Warfare and conflict were the grim realities of a dangerous time. Muhammad's uncle taught him the skills he'd need to survive in a world where even a prophet would wield a bow and arrow. In a wilderness punished by the elements and bereft of water, rivalry over a single well could provoke a blood feud for generations. A real rivalry, real battles, and sometimes quite bloody. So the allegiance of individuals was to the family, immediately and at a larger extent to the tribe. Without the tribe's protection, no one could endure. Scattered across the peninsula were countless factions, all embroiled in bitter struggles. 
each defending its precious grazing lands, trade routes, and most importantly, its wells. Well, you have to understand, in most of the lands are dry. And so water is, is something that oh, everyone always considers precious. For those of us in climates that are more heavily watered, it's difficult to understand the depth and the centrality of the symbol of water in societies that uh, are desert and in which uh, it only rains once or twice a year and in which uh, a little water makes the difference between life and death. Each clan had its own separate gods and totems to water and wind, fire and night. They were kept in the caravan town of Mecca, in a shrine of wood, stone and cloth. It was called the Kaaba, the Arabic word for cube. Pre-Islamic Arabs worshipped a number of spirits, and they were generally nature-oriented spirits, sometimes associated with natural, natural features like trees or rocks or springs. And uh, the Kaaba in Mecca was one of a number of these sanctuaries centered around a particular cluster of deities. It was said the Hebrew patriarch Abraham himself built the Kaaba centuries before and that a sacred black stone it held within had fallen from the sky. In these turbulent times, the Kaaba provided a rare place of peace. Only here would the Bedouin submit to a temporary truce before returning to their conflicts of the open sands. There was this one place in the middle, around the Kaaba, which was, from even pre-Islamic times, was a place of uh, a sacred enclosure where all people had to put down their arms. And this, of course, facilitated trading uh, because it meant that you couldn't carry on your feuds when you were doing your buying and selling. The spiritual and economic importance of the Kaaba in Mecca are pretty hard to separate in, in, as far as the pre-Islamic Arabs are concerned. The Kaaba made Mecca a vibrant center for trade. Here were found Arabian incense, exotic perfumes and Indian spices, Chinese silks and Egyptian linens. But perhaps the greatest treasure to be found at Mecca was the rich mixture of cultures. There were people who came through town who had all kinds of interesting experiences to relate to faraway places. The local religion was mixed. There were Christians, there were Jews, and there were also the Arabs of the desert who followed an animist type of religion. Muhammad's world was a center of trade, connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean linking the aging empires of Byzantium and Persia to the great bazaars of India and China. Muhammad became a merchant. In fact, he had a great flair for trade. At the age of 25, while leading a caravan northward to Syria, his talents caught the eye of the shipment's owner, a wealthy widow named Khadija. She was so taken with Muhammad, she proposed marriage. Ah, Khadija. Well, I think she was a mentor as well as a wife, a very strong lady who had her own business, and Muhammad was helping her out. So it was a wonderful partnership, and I'm sure he learned a lot from her. He had a tremendous amount of contact with merchants coming from different parts uh, of the world, passing through the Arabian Peninsula. I think he was a very intelligent man, very open-minded, and he was able to communicate with a great variety of peoples. He must have had great charisma as well. Mohammed had a way with people and with resolving their disputes. 
Once, when the Kaaba fell into disrepair, the clan chieftains quarreled over who would have the honor of putting the sacred black stone back where it belonged. Before violence could erupt, Muhammad proposed an equitable solution. United in the effort, the four leaders shared the weight and the honor. In gratitude, they invited Muhammad himself to replace the sacred stone. He became known as Al-Amin, the trusted one. There are all kinds of indications that he was tremendously interested in, in religious questions. This is obviously not something that an ordinary person probably was interested in in those days. He talked to uh, sages, Arab sages. He talked to Jewish and Christian sages who lived in the area. He used to go up into the rock hills around Mecca and meditate, think about things. And at some point had this extraordinary vision, which is spoken about very evocatively and elusively. In a cave above Mecca, Muhammad had an experience that would be the defining moment of his life. An angel was said to appear before him in the form of a man, instructing him to recite in the name of God, the Almighty. For Muhammad, it was an encounter as profound as it was deeply disturbing. You get a sense of what it would be like to be a normal person in society, perhaps unusual in the sense of your intensity for things like social justice and finding out what the meaning of life is, but not being uh, endowed with anything that would seem, seem miraculous by your friends, and all of a sudden having this voice come to you and then come out of you as you speak it and recite it to other people. And that is the beginning of the prophetic career of Muhammad. The months to come would bring more revelations. Powerful words of a lyrical quality, more beautiful than the most exquisite Arabic poetry. Above all, Muhammad was to bear one message to his people, a simple yet radical proclamation, that there is only one God. The central tenet of Islam is the oneness, the indivisible unity of God, uh, not something that is simply, uh, that one pays lip service to, but something that is absolutely the most important concept. Divine unity is more than saying God is, there's only one God and there aren't other, other deities. It's only thinking about one thing. So to be thinking about possessions, to be thinking about status, to be thinking about power, are all intellectual idols. The implications were staggering. One God meant one people no more tribal divisions. To the poor and unprotected, the prospect was revolutionary. It seems to me that one of the most important things of, in his early teaching that isn't, isn't often talked about is the strong social justice message that he delivered. In Mecca of the time, there was an increasing separation between the haves and the have-nots. He insisted that it, this was not to be and that we should share the wealth and it was this social justice message that I think that really got him a hearing among many of the folks. So coming with Islam, it was a new order, a new way of life. And it was a beautiful way of life because everybody was equal, black, white, men, women, children. So it had that type of uh, universal appeal, which I think was the reason why Islam spread so rapidly. Many were moved by Muhammad's message as he began to speak out in the community. It had the 
suppleness and symbolic depth of the great pre-Islamic poems that had been created by this people and that had given this people in Arabia such an extraordinary ear for verbal expression, where verbal expression was the commanding cultural force. Some people called him a poet, and there's a Quranic uh, surah basically saying, uh, Muhammad is not a poet. Poets speak through desire. Uh, this is not the voice of desire, this is the voice of God. Muhammad's following began to grow. They called themselves Muslims, for those who surrender to God. They set out to preserve the message Muhammad had brought. This was the beginning of the Quran. The Quran was revealed orally. But very soon, people realized that it had to be written down in order to make sure that it wasn't corrupted and that the original message was maintained. And from a very early date, and it's, it's very unclear when that date was, because no early manuscripts of the Quran survive, people began copying it down. The Quran is a revelation of spiritual teaching of both ethical and social guidance. It was revealed and remains in Arabic. To the non-believers, the divine reckoning Muhammad invoked was an outrage. His dismantling of their heritage and customs deeply unsettling. It was a threat, a threat in several ways, to their social order, to their age-old traditions, and an economic threat because of the importance of the pilgrimage shrine of the Kaaba in Mecca. As Muhammad's following increased, the social fabric of the caravan city began to unravel. Business suffered as pilgrims and traders, worried for their safety, left town. The tribal leaders decided Muhammad and his message must be removed permanently. They didn't want him taking over. They didn't want him horning in on their control of the city. They made things very difficult for him, perhaps even plotted his assassination. They tried to keep him away from the Kaaba. They did everything they could to kind of run him out of town. They demanded that Muhammad's uncle remove his clan's protection from the Prophet, which would clear the way for his murder without the threat of retribution. But his uncle refused. The battle lines were drawn. Nothing short of tribal war would settle the conflict now.